Uh, we've got two teams that are working on this particular project. One, we have an experiment in humanities lab. Um, so for four or five years in that lab, we've been working on um, using natural language processing to change the research workflows in particularly theological and religious studies. So um, we have that team. Um, and then we have just um, started a, an AI institute um, that is Henry Luce uh, Foundation funded. Thanks, thanks to Luce. Um, and uh, the, the, the institute is, is primarily focused on this um, trust framework over here. I mentioned this a little bit yesterday, but um, everything we do at the institute is, is really geared toward building an AI ecosystem that is transparent, responsible, user-centered, sustainable, and collaborative or together. Um, pardon the acronym, right? Um, so even this project here, um, which is uh, th this uh, Bible commentator project we're working on, is actually an extension of uh, an AI tutor project that we're building uh, to plug into our online classroom spaces to see if we can um, inject new perspectives into, into classrooms that sometimes become echo chambers, yeah? Um, so all the things we do are sort of embedded in this trust framework. Um, okay, so why bother with any of this um, sort of machine learning, particularly as it regards to this trust framework? Well, our team considers machines as partners. Um, we heard a lot yesterday about um, the, something other than the instrumental notion of technologies. Um, when we approach artificial intelligence and machine learning, we think about machines as partners in the research task or the reading task or whatever other task. We don't think of machines as just tools. Um, so, so, and we think, that's, it, we think that's a really important way forward for us because machines offer us access to difference. Right to um, different ways of thinking. Um, and as um, in Cursor, Frederica asked a question regarding Hannah's point about something uh, our team had written out there in reference, to, um, oh, in reference to Hannah makes some really interesting points about the mythology of big data, right? Um, we're not interested at all in sort of fostering that mythology that big data just makes everything better, right? Or that, that machines are superior to humans. That's not interesting to us. What we're interested in is how are machines different and what can we learn from that, okay? So, um, and we think that that approach can foster this trust-based approach so that we're not just trying to domesticate machines, so that we actually challenge our tendency to domesticate things, particularly things we don't understand, like a neural network. How many of us understand a neural network? Cliff, raise your hand. Right. Okay. Um, so anyway, so that's why we, we really deeply believe this, um, and and we take a, a non-scarcity based approach to to machine learning. So those, it's uh, I totally respect the the perspectives of folks who think that this whole AI thing is scary and bad and going to do all kinds of horrible things. I think we need to have that conversation, but we come from a perspective of what can we learn from these things. So let's do that. Um, the other, so um, the other sort of theoretical framework that we sort of bring to these tasks is, is this notion of interface. And we'll hear lots more about this from Frederica because she actually, I think, does better things with it than I do. Um, but so I, a lot of my academic work has been in exploring um, particularly Bible as interface. And so I'm deeply indebted here to Joanna Drucker, um, um, who is a, a sort of communication theorist, media theorist. Um, uh, and I, so what we mean by interface is something that provokes probabilistic production. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to get to showing things, but um, I have a lot to say about interface. I think we'll have more time to talk about it. I think um, many of these terms relate to things we heard yesterday, such as non-neutrality of technology, um, identities as constructed or produced rather than just existing, things like that. So this, this notion of interface is, has been swimming around in our conversations already. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot from that, so thanks to everybody for that. Um, okay, let's get into some technologies. Um, so who's heard of GPT-2? Yeah? A couple, yeah? So, so yeah, yeah, so GPT-2, uh, I mean, you might have read about it in, in, in what I wrote, too. So GPT-2, uh, yeah, I wasn't telling, I wasn't asking you to say whether you read what I wrote or not, so. Um, so this GPT-2 is a language model. Right? So basically, a, a large statistical representation of how the English language primarily functions. Right? Um, it's built by uh, OpenAI, 
if we know who runs OpenAI or who did run it, who started it? Elon Musk, right? So it's Elon Musk's um, it's Tesla's sort of research arm, that sort of thing, right? A um, lot of controversy around GPT-2. Uh, we could spend the whole day talking about the ethics around this particular model and how it was released and built and all that sort of stuff. But again, I will try to stop myself. Um, but anyway, it's a language model. And the reason it's important is it's only in the last few years where machine learning tasks have been able to leverage large pre-trained language models. So already built data sets to be used to do tasks with language, with machines, okay? Even three years ago, we would have had to start from scratch to build a language model. We would have had to get a whole truckload of data, right? Run that data through a whole bunch of compute for a long, 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 long time, and then we'd get the beginnings of the language model. Now, people with a whole lot more money and time have done a bunch of that work for us and made it available, right? So um, GPT-2's got a bunch of versions. Um, it's a huge, huge language model. And it is just a neural network. That's what it is, right? It's built on a neural network, um, a really, really big one, um, that you could actually remake if you wanted to. Um, so why do I say this? Because GPT-2 is really good at writing um, and reading. So um, we are building our Bible commentator and our AI tutor on top of GPT-2, OK? So it's a language model that can do things like text generation. Let's see how it works, yeah? Um, Here's an example. Let's see if I can zoom this so you can see it. This morning, oh, well, let me zoom. You can't see that, huh? Hang on. Now we'll, we'll just run it again. Uh, this morning, here, let's just go to it. Anybody tried Talk to Transformer? Yeah. Did it weird you out a little bit? Yes. Yeah? Okay, so, um, so Talk to Transformer, I, I'm going to give us a look at what the regular GPT 2 does when we give it text. So, what GPT 2 does is Based on a prompt, it predicts the next word that it thinks would come uh, in that sentence. Okay? That's what it's trained to do. It's trained to do that one thing. That's really what it was trained to do, although it's really, really useful on other tasks too, it turns out. But it was trained to predict the next word in a sequence of words. Okay? Based on uh, something like, I don't remember the size, but based on a data set primarily from the web um, and a lot of it. Okay? So if we type something in here, so somebody give me a, a, the beginning of a phrase. Anything? The sun is shining. The sun is shining. The sun is shining at Princeton today. So we should, ready? And I'm going to click this complete text. So this guy, Adam King, has built a web interface for you to just test out how GPT-2 works. OK? So this says, the sun is shining, so we start with the sun is shining at Princeton today, so we should, and then it starts, and again, it's, it's writing this word by word, right? It's not going and finding text that exists out there. It's actually writing this word by word, and every word it writes, it feeds back to itself, that word, in, in sequence, and then figures out the next word. We should all go out and celebrate. <laughs> I do not intend to criticize your choice of holiday for Christmas Eve, but I will say, that I think it should be, in all respects, a secular holiday. For centuries now, Christians have observed Christmas, at least formally, as an act of thanksgiving for the birth of Jesus. But it's also a day of celebration, a day of joy. For Christians, the celebration of the... That's not bad. <laughs> right? Like, I have students who don't write this well. I mean, I don't write this well sometimes. So, um, you know, I, I think part of the point here is like, whoa. What kind of questions does this raise about what it means to be creative? What, what does it mean to be a writer and a reader? Um, do we write probabilistically like machines do? Is that what my brain is doing? Or are we doing something else, right? I, I don't know. Maybe we can learn some things from the machine. Okay, so that's what generic, so feel free to go out there and play around with this. It's, 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 it can be hilarious. Um, and you can give it long text and it'll do funny things with it, okay? Oh. Yeah, it gets really bizarre. Yeah, and it's it's not very exactly. Yeah, 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 and it's so so that's so so that's a great segue for for us. So um, the gener generic GPT two is pretty good at um, kind of general tasks like writing like that. It, it also can do some other things, but it's not tuned to any particular discourse. Okay, so if you have a discourse that doesn't necessarily fit with Reddit, which is where it got most of its data, right? then it's not going to quite know how to negotiate in that space, right? It'll, it'll still write things, um, 
it, it, but it, it won't necessarily know. So one of the beautiful things about the way the machine learning landscape works most of the time today is people make these models available and we can build on top of them, right? So we, our team, can take GPT-2, right? So this, this generic language model, and we can add layers to it that tune it to the discourse we're interested in, okay? So if I'm in a classroom, I can add all of the text being used in the classroom and all of the conversations that have happened in that classroom. I can add that as a layer to this language model and train it again, uh, and it'll start talking like the class, which is pretty cool, huh? Um, we could also add other things. Anyway, so what we find really challenging, both for this Bible commentator um, kind of toy and, and for our AI tutor is this, this competing optimization task, right? We want to help, we want to learn from machines, both, we want to teach machines both how to fit a discourse, right? But also how to introduce newness, right? And we believe both are possible, but it's, it's not, it's, they're a competing optimization task. And I thought to myself last night, maybe this is similar to us submitting a paper to any publication, right? It's maybe not that different, right? That, oh, I have to sound like the, the journal in order for them to even pay attention to it, but I have to offer something new also. So how do we do that complex task, right? And, and how do machines do it, okay? So that's our competing, that's our task, right? And so in terms of the, the Bible commentator, so this particular kind of project, basically we wanted to say, okay, can we pass GPT-2, a trained GPT-2, um, a verse, and have it give us something back that looks a bit like Commentate, commentary or reflections on, on the passage, okay? That was our goal, um, kind of a silly goal. Um, we sort of started with lots of questions around like, well, should we just be generating Bible, right? What's the difference between generating commentary and generating Bible? I think that's the best question, actually. Um, and so, in fact, uh, we have a, I didn't even put it on the slide, but uh, we have a colleague, Timothy Beal. Anybody follow KGVBot on um, Twitter? So yeah, Tim, Tim Beale is a religious studies prof at Case Western um, Reserve University. He built a KJV bot uh, using um, simpler technologies than this called Markov chains, where he takes the King James Bible um, and gives it three word seeds and uh, a machine generates uh, utterances and tweets them. Uh, and and uh, that's what the KJV bot does and it sounds a lot like the Bible. And it's very interesting to, to read those and think, oh, I can't tell whether that is actually a verse or not, right? Because it sounds a lot like Bible. But so we do, we do like to sort of generate Bible too. But in this case, we wanted to try to build a model that could take a verse and give us commentary on a verse. Um, wow. I'm supposed to stop. So, um, yeah, I won't, I won't take too much longer. But so I just wanted to give you a, a little look at what our data looks like although most people won't care. Basically, we started with, the, the, the take home here is our data is terrible right now, right? So the model's not that good because we don't have access to really good data. And at the end of the day, this is the major problem with most machine learning tasks um, that you'll try to encounter, right? Is how do you get access to good data and how do you prepare that data well? And in this case, we have people who can prepare data well. We don't have the rights to, to, to very many commentaries, right? Because ideal world is we would take all the text of the Bible and give it to this model, and we would take all the commentaries out there in the world, actually in all the languages if we could, and we would feed it to this model, train it, train it, train it, train it, train it, and then we would see what the model did, right? But the, the, the commentaries that we have access to for public domain or even open access are pretty bad, right? So we started with um, trying to do something with open access models. Uh, open access uh, data, and it turns out the data is so bad that um, this is just a, I just wanted to note that we do use old technologies too, right? So this is my, my uh, AI engineer, a engineer and I were drawing kind of the model of our map, uh, the map of our model. This is our early model trying to use the commentator, uh, commentary data, and it just didn't work. So now, our friend Timothy Beal, who did the KJV bot, you should follow KJV bot on Twitter, by the way. Um, he gave us the text of his uh, Princeton University Press book uh, on Revelation. So we took the text of that and we trained, basically trained the, the GPT-2 on Tim's book um, in some fancy ways uh, based on that diagram. And so our model right now is really called Timmy because it's really Tim Beal uh, tuned uh, and how Tim Beal talks about Revelation. So let's give it a shot. Um, we'll come back to these other prompts if it doesn't work. But um, let's go here. 
Oh, bummer. Um, let's see. So this is going to, sorry, I'm going to have to run a few commands here. Sorry. So what I'm going to do here is load up our model, right? So we're lucky to have a big giant uh, GPU machine um, in our lab that we can use. You don't have to do that. You can use Amazon and things like this um, um, to do the same thing. But if you want to run a bunch of experiments, it can get expensive. Um, so source. So these are the things that we could teach for. Anybody who wants to learn how to, how to do this, I'm happy to teach them. It is not hard. Uh, okay, so we're gonna say Python 3 commentator. All right, so it's gonna take a minute to load. So what it's doing now is it's loading up our model, okay? It's gonna say, okay, we've trained and trained and trained for hours and hours and hours on this model, right? So, and obviously we haven't trained it enough. You'll see that it's, it's not, a great model yet, but so we've done a whole bunch of training on top of GPT-2 using Tim Beal's book and some other strategies to get us a model that we're going to load up here, and then we're going to ask, we're going to give it a verse. So um, let's go here to, we just need a verse from Revelation, uh, let's see, NRSV, I'm using the NRSV because that's what Tim uses in his book, um, so if we go, oh wait. Let's try this. Okay. Anybody have a favorite verse in Revelation? No? All right. Let's just give it um, something like, uh, blessed is the one who reads aloud. Yeah. Something like this. Okay. Copy. I'm going to give it a verse. Okay. So I'm giving the model a verse. And then the, the, we get to say, okay, how many words do we want the model to add to this? We're going to say 200 just for funsies. And then the way the model works is um, it goes through, um, it takes the prompt and it goes and, and predicts the next word, but it gives, it'll give us a set of next words based on probabilities, and then um, it'll randomly pick, based on probabilities, one of those words to put next. And we can say, how many do you want me to pick from? So we want to pick from 15 um, and give us five examples of this, okay? And then I, I promise I'll stop after this. Takes a minute to run. And again, this is running on a really, really fast machine. Um, okay, so the first response, it is the seven eras of creation. <laughs> Augustan connectivity, that's a new word. Uh, yeah, yeah, as the seven according to Ezekiel's vision of creation and a seven hook of biblical history of biblical history. See how it starts getting repetitive? It begins with the seven heads of general history of creation. Augustan eyes have seven time, blah, 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 blah. Right, it's trying to do references as well. Um, here, as with Joachim, Revelation, as with Joachim, so Joachim's somebody that Tim deals with in his book, right? As in this sense, the saints both prophecy, the word of God both... The, so this is not as good as we saw earlier, right? The, the, the general GPT-2 was really, really good at writing interesting things. Our model, look at that, look at number four. That's not so good, right? So, so what happens, what happens in, these, in these cases is as we start to train it on a different discourse, it takes a long time to get it back to stabilize to actually write meaningful things. And we need way more data. And so the, what we're going for next is how do we get access to better data and what kinds of model designs will help us um, tune this to actually um, talk about the passage rather than just continue it, okay? Because one of the things that GPT-2 does by nature is tries to continue the sentence. We don't want to continue, right? We want something more like a question and answer sort of thing. So anyway, um, I could show you lots more examples, but that's basically what we're doing, um, and that's what it looks like, and I'm happy to show anybody the code behind it if they want to see it. I also promised a couple others yesterday. I'm happy to teach you Python if you want to learn Python, because um, I do think the materialities of these technologies matter um, as to how we engage them. And so those of us in this room, insofar as we can learn a little bit about how a model works, about how the programming works, how the data looks, the, the more I think we can be um, partners in the discussion with engineers and others who are, who are making decisions about how this stuff is designed. I'm going to stop there. <laughs>